recording go hello everyone and welcome to episode eight of the mental health family hour episode eight you know is is absolutely flown by and thank you very much for for tuning in week upon week so today we're going to be talking about resilience peer pressure and bullying so just to start with some housekeeping if you're watching the live stream please feel free to ask any questions as we go along dave will pick them up uh, if you're watching back on youtube we have disabled the comments but you're able to email myself the emails on the slide which you can see uh, as it says there neither sam or dave are a helpline so we will try and respond to you as soon as possible uh, if you contact us on social media but we we probably won't be able to get back to you straight away now if anything does upset you or anything is quite triggering uh, throughout this episode please reach out for, for, to some of the services that we've put out on the slide, the Samaritans, Shout, and also the Hub of Hope, which I, you know, we promote every um, time we do this. Just type in your postcode and it'll list all the local services available, available to you in that area. Honestly, I think sometimes, because I'm repeating this, my, my, my words end up coming out like... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Once again, if you are tuning in for the first time, who am I and who is Dave? Dave is Dave. <laughs> My name is Sam Tyra. I'm the founder of a service called Change Talks. So over the last three years, I've been delivering education with the aim to try and prevent mental health issues. And I'm Dave Cottrell, who is absolutely loving what Sam's bringing to the table today. We did one <laughs> we did one recorded for the first time, not live yesterday. And when we're live, we have this pressure to just keep on going. Whereas yesterday, it was like, no, stop it. Let's start again yeah. a few times at the beginning. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think neither one of us knew how long this was going to go on for when we started it. Um, because when, when we do this in schools, it's what, five or six weeks? So yep. we're up to eight weeks now. And it's been fantastic. Um, my background, I'm a, I'm a personal trainer for the mind. I help people work with their mental health issues by helping them develop new habits, break old habits, bring up new routines, work on things like their own resilience and things like that, that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and also obviously go and do that in, in seminars and in schools. And I'm actually quite excited about the fact that we're going to be able to do that face to face in schools again soon. And yeah, just just as a note from myself at this point, is to say thank you everyone for um, for tuning in for the last the last eight weeks. It's been fantastic to go on this journey with everyone, and I really hope that it's brought some value. We are going to be doing a a question and answer show for episode ten, uh, two weeks today. And again, if I just nip back on the slides one more time, you want to send those messages to Sam on um, that sam.tyra at lancashirecare.nhs.uk. Um, anything we have covered, anything we haven't covered, and we just really want to kind of, you know, get back to the things that you guys and girls are struggling with directly, whether that is for yourself um, or for, you know, for a relative. As I said last week, please actually give us more information than you think is necessary when you send those questions, because when we get those questions face to face in a room, we do be able, we are able to fire back and ask a few more questions back ourselves and get a little bit more of that information mm -hmm. so even if you think something might be irrelevant just just tell us i'd rather read a slightly longer message and uh, although sam's going to be reading the emails so it's not me <laughs> i'd rather read a slightly longer message and get more context so that we can actually really delve into that for you and we don't meet myself or dave we don't mind if any of the questions are personal about our, our own experiences you know as you have you seen over the last eight weeks my myself and Dave have been really open about our struggles so if anyone actually wants to ask any questions in regards to that then we are open to that as well is that okay from your perspective Dave as well yeah 100 more yeah. than happy um I'll share whatever <laughs> we've had we've had a lot of pupils haven't we young uh young pupils ask questions especially to when you've come in uh yeah um well I think again because I open up about having bipolar disorder um is that when someone else struggles with bipolar disorder, it's really nice to be able to speak to somebody else who's a little bit further along with it, especially, um, yeah, bipolar disorder as a teenager. It's one of the most one of the most misunderstood like conditions. Well, most conditions when you're a teenager, um, they're really it's really hard to understand and it's really hard to get the information because you don't even know what questions to ask. Really, one of the things I've been doing with with certain clients recently, with adult clients, is actually helping them by telling them what to say to the doctor to get the actual help that they need. Because the doctors um, or your teachers, this the thing is when we have a mental health situation, it's not like we're taking a car into a mechanics and we go in and we go, oh, well, there's a, yeah, there's something clanging around with that. I think it might be like the fan belt or whatever. It's like, we don't need to know anything about the car. The mechanic does because they just open up the, the bonnet of the car or the hood if anyone's watching from America. They open up the bonnet of the car they find out, they figure it out. Whereas with a doctor or with a therapist or with a counselor, 
each of those people can only go off what you tell them. So it's really great to actually have, you know, to have people come up and open up to me because the more I can understand about what they're physically experiencing or mentally experiencing, the more I can maybe point them in the right direction. And I think I find it an absolute honor to be able to create that space for people and to kind of, you know, be someone who's willing to put himself into his job and willing to kind of put my own emotion and my own, um, my own personal story on the line. And if, and if there are any schools watching, which we know has been happening uh, week upon week other than last week, if any of your pupils want to ask any questions, just please email, email me on their behalf and we're open to anything. So moving on to the first slide. So before I ask Dave some questions and then obviously I give my input as well, I want you to think about what do you think resilience is before we actually answer this question. So if I was to ask you what is resilience, what does that mean to you? So Dave what is resilience what is resilience resilience is our ability to handle um adversity i'm not going to say stress stress is too little and um, it's our ability to handle adversity in life and by adversity i mean struggles and challenges um a resilient person is a person that like you know that whole um like that um ah what's his name denzel washington the get the fall down seven times get up eight a resilient person that is that it's not about the person who goes through who never has any difficulties in their life it is about a person who does have the difficulties and how they bounce back from them and there's a lot of different components to it and actually we've covered a lot of them already and um, self-esteem is a huge part of it self-awareness is the one we're going to start with today because we didn't really talk about self-awareness during the self-esteem session but self-awareness self-esteem our ability to forgive ourselves is forgive is part of resilience our ability to um to forgive other people we're going to be talking about that today is resilience and yeah just understanding our purpose and understanding what we're doing things for and living as close as we can to our values a person who goes to like you know the, a resilient person generally will go to bed at night feeling like they've lived close to their values and they they no matter what life has done that day no matter how the external world is as um as has served up things that day that person can go to bed knowing that they did what they believe to be right um, and that is you know that is a big part of resilience as well great thank you for that answer dave so could you explain to us what you mean by perceptual positions okay so I will, I'll, I'll try and put this in the i've put it in first person second person observer and well because you know what we've kind of been talking a lot to the adults a lot over the last few weeks to the, te to the teachers um, but to the kids let's talk about video games because we understand like we understand kind of video games we understand I like at first, yeah, Sam doesn't. Sam is not a young person. Sam is <laughs> Sam is a ninety-year-old trapped inside of a, of a twenty-something's body. Or you, did you turn thirty recently? Twenty-seven. Oh, you're not even remotely thirty. Yeah. <laughs> I always forget this. Um, so, first person. Think about a first-person shooter. We're talking like Call of Duty. Call of Duty is a first-person shooter. What that is is you're seeing the world through the eyes of the character that you're playing. Um, we're talking about we've got second person on here and then third person second person doesn't really come up in games third person's when you're seeing over the shoulder so you're seeing it as a camera following the person now this is about how we look at the world so first person we generally view the world through first person which means we're looking at it through our own eyes and when we're looking at things through our eyes we're looking at it with our own bias as well and our bias means how does this you know like if we think about that computer game how does this character see the world you know what 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 is important to them and when we look at it through our own eyes, it's how do we see the world? Now, second person is how do other people see us? And we've probably all heard expressions like, you know, oh, you know, imagine walking a mile in someone else's shoes or try and look at it from someone else's perspective. And these are all nice things to say, but not a lot of people actually genuinely practice these. So it's, um, it's worth actually sitting down and saying, right, well, how did I come across in that situation? And then the observer situation, and I'll go through examples of all three of these in a sec, but the observer situation is kind of like when we're watching a movie. And when we're watching a movie, we're seeing, or we're watching a film or a game, we've got a cut scene, everything's happening and we're watching from the side, we're seeing the whole thing unfold. And you'll probably find that when, when we're watching films or TV shows, we pick up on completely different things than we would if we were that character that was in the room that was just kind of like, and you sit there screaming at the TV, why can't she see that? What's he doing? Why is he walking? Like we, as the observer, we look at it because what we're looking at that we're looking at it with an unbiased opinion 
and this is the thing we never really look at ourselves with an unbiased opinion we'll actually in self-awareness you know the type of people that have come to me will have self-awareness probably at both at one end of the spectrum or the other they'll either be the person who um, almost narcissistic believes themselves to be the best person in the world ever and everyone else to be wrong and therefore almost a level of self-awareness that is self-love that's off the charts um, to the point at which they will not see any of their own flaws or I have the opposite which is self-deprecation which is a person who looks at themselves through a lens where they are always thinking I'm the worst person in the world if bad things happen to me, it's because I'm a bad person versus the person on the other side of the scale, which is if bad things happen to me, it's because the world is full of bad people and I'm a great person. And these are the type, this, this, this is the type of extremes that we see. And a lot of times it's about looking at kind of, again, what we talked about with the looking glass self last week with that expression. And I really hope that some people did that homework. Um, you know that I, I really like the one, I, if people did the homework where I said, ask someone else what it means to be enough in their eyes. Um, or what you think it means to be enough in their eyes, because this is where we get into second person. This is where we start right, thinking, right, okay, how do I see myself? Okay, like look at an argument now, like have an argument and then imagine yourself in the other person's shoes. And actually suddenly we have this tendency to write ourselves as the hero of our story. So, you know, if I was telling you about an argument that I'd had with my wife, I'd be like, you know, and I just, all I'd said, all I said was this, and I'll put it like nice and flat. And like, all I said was, you know, um, you know, maybe we should, uh, like, maybe you should run a little bit less. This is kind of <laughs> got to go into genuine arguments here. Um, my wife runs, I, I run, but she runs like six or seven times a week um, and then complains that she's not getting enough sleep. And I'm just like, run less, sleep more, it's simple. But, all, but I'd be like, all I said was like, run less. And then she was like, why are you always critiquing? And, you know, we kind of play our bit down, play the other bit up. Whenever we explain an argument or a fight that we had with someone, we, we, we basically frame ours up to be like we were the good guy. And we, frame, and we frame the other person up to be they were the bad guy. And we just do this. We're naturally biased towards it. And it, it, it's about sitting down and saying, actually, right, how did I really come across in that situation? Like what was, how did I look in that? And then imagine it, imagine like that person walk into the room, imagine what they're, how they are seeing you, imagine how it looks from the outside. And that's like, how do I look from the other person? If I walked into the room and I was like, oh, like giving that sort of vibe off to that person, how does that appear? How is that gonna set things up? Um, and then the third one, the observer is about, it's about sitting back and kind of looking at it without any emotion. Because when we look at things, we often look at things with emotion. Um, and that emotion can often stop us from seeing things and like actually changing things. So we can get very, very defensive, you know. I, as a coach or as a teacher, teachers, it's like if a teacher has to go and if, the, if, a, if a kid's piece of work isn't quite good enough or like, you know, we go back into that whole, it doesn't mean they're not good enough. It just means that we want this piece of work to be good enough, to be, to be better. So we have to approach that in a way where, where we kind of leave the emotion out of it. Like we kind of approach that in a way where we say, okay, this is what needs to be done. And if the, if the kid focuses on the kind of emotional side of it, it's like, okay, we want to look at objectively what is the actual situation as opposed to that, as opposed to like, am I, um, you know, we can get so caught up in the emotion of whether or not we're good at a certain thing that, that we become hypersensitive to criticism about that. And this, this doesn't lead to a very resilient person because again, a resilient person um, there's going to be there's going to be criticism or even at, at worst there's going to be criticism in life at best there's going to be differences of opinion and if we when we look at this situation we look at it through that first person view and we look at it that I'm the victim they're the villain that is the person that is having a disagreement with us then we're going to kind of get defensive with that person and instead of saying actually learning from that person or, or learning not always that person could be being you know an absolute horror about the whole thing they could be being mean but they could be saying something that is valuable to us and um, I often like you know we you know yourself and me we both get criticized about where um, our work does get you know holes get picked in it from time to time and and we've got to sit back and say well is that valid 
Is what that person's saying valid? It's not even a case of, do I like the way they've said it? It's like, well, what are they actually saying? Because there is opportunities to learn within criticism. There's actually more of an opportunity to learn within criticism than there is with someone agreeing with you. So it's like, okay, right. Well, let's just look at it from that person's perspective for a second. And then we look at it and we think about it. Like that person, what are they trying to achieve? Is that person my parent? That person's my teacher? What what are they? What, what's their perspective? Well, their perspective is, okay, maybe they're a bit stressed. Maybe they're going through a hard time. Maybe they they've just returned into work and they're, they're and they're um you know they're in they're physically in the room with kids for the first time in t like seven, eight, nine, ten weeks. It's like and we we try and look at that and take into account self awareness. Actually, in a weird way, is about not just being completely and utterly aware of yourself. It's being aware of you and your position within each of these interacting stories. If someone is struggling with, with low resilience or someone is worried about a service user or a patient that appears to not be a very re resilient individual, how would, how would you advise somebody to, to improve their resilience? Are you talking about the person themselves or the person that's approaching? Both. Okay, so both. the thing about improving resilience is as the person who what who who is, wants to be more resilient and um or should we say needs to be more resilient right that person does need to want to be more resilient so mm -hmm. it's not the resilience isn't like none of the stuff that we've talked about really is anything that can be forced on anybody else and this is important it's like you, you have to kind of want to do it and this stuff you know if you're let's say you're 15 and watching this right now you might actually only realize the importance of this in like five years time and actually want to do it then we've talked about this before about how um in schools we we, we hear so many people when well people say to us they wish that they had something like what we're teaching in schools when they were in school and i'm like great we're doing it now but then i'm like okay i also wish that i'd have paid more attention to french when i was in school I didn't, obviously. I only started caring about French when I was an adult and I wanted to learn another language. Now, this is the whole thing is that any of these subjects that we've talked about, the first step is that the person needs to want to make the change, the change themselves. You can't force a change on somebody else. What you can do is you can like, so that's, so if you're wanting to, to actually, to improve these things then you're already on you're already one step ahead really because you want to improve it and the way to improve it is a lot of times it's actually well the one thing i would say is take a second before you respond because there's there's two ways you can um you ever read any victor frankel man search for meaning i have not no. no okay okay so man search for meaning um is about how it's, it's um, Victor Frankl was, um, he's a psychologist, but he was in Auschwitz and he was um, as, a, you know, as a prisoner. And he talks about, he talks a lot about resilience and he says, we can't always change um, the way the world is treating us, but what we always have control over is our reaction. And um, it's basically, it's, we always have an opportunity to change our reaction. And reaction, you've got two, two options really. You've got reaction and response. A reaction is knee-jerk, right? Is as soon as someone says something to you, straight back, you know, almost defense mechanisms a lot of times, like, like knee-jerk reaction, full-on defense mechanism. And then we can snap back at a person. And that's gonna, that's gonna change the pathway that that conversation goes. You snap back at someone, you, you have to have someone that's extremely patient on the opposite side if you're going to snap back at someone and expect a good outcome from that and it's about so if you want to improve your resilience one of the best things you can do there is actually learn to take a moment before you react and then that reaction becomes a response now you've got to understand that we have about i don't know it's, it's actually something like 14 million or something thoughts throughout the course of the day or 14 million pieces of information come in throughout the course of the day and we have the chance to react. And you know what? Let's take this back to computer games for a second, right? I was um, I was playing The Witcher 3 a couple of nights back and someone came on and said to me, oh, be careful how you respond in the conversations because it changes the way the game unfolds. Perfect timing for this, really. Because that's the whole thing is that when that happens, you get a thing on screen and you've got, you know, option one is this, option two is this. And you can sort of over the t over time, you get an idea for what type of options are going to lead you towards the good path or the bad path. And this is the thing is that we don't, we don't often sit there and weigh up the options in our head. We go with the one that comes first. 
And that that's not self-awareness. That is that is running your programming. That is whatever your program towards you will run that program. Um, almost to a degree, again, carrying on with the, the computer game analogy, is you become a non-player character. You become someone who is scripted. They respond in a certain way. And we don't want that. We want to be able to... Um, we want to be able to choose a response rather than a reaction, rather than the dialogue of this whole world being set out and the story being on rails and then you've got no impact to it. We want to know that actually we can always change something within that situation. And the one way I would say to do that is take a breath, think about your possible outcomes and actually think about the, the options of what you want to say and then try different things. Um, try like we going back to week two when we talked about communication and that tennis match from hell you know that that whole yeah. thing of that the person the parent says tidy your room and the kids like you're always saying this when I'm on Fortnite and then and the same conversation happens it's like okay we change any stage in that conversation and the rest of it changes thereafter and this is the important thing so with if with resilience yes it's there's often about the what, what happens to you but then there are certainly things that our reactions to situations then lead to the next situation that comes up and so on and so forth and we always have control within our own i say always it doesn't feel like always we've had a couple of questions come in already would you like me to jump into them for a second yeah go for it Dave. yeah um, and then i'll go back to what per well actually sorry but i'll just go back to the other side of it if you are someone trying to help another person with resilience if, talk to them about it and as and as it a co and uh, talk about it as a concept because that person's going to need to want to improve their resilience themselves but the best thing you can do is show that person patience mm -hmm. um understand that if like okay we don't just want to automatically nerf the whole situation put bubble wrap around everything and 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 do that but at the same time we want to be able to still try and challenge that person within within their realm so we go back to comfort zones that we talked about a few weeks back is that you don't want to be challenging that person with something that's a million miles outside their comfort zone if you're going to challenge that person understand the person that you're challenging understand what is considered a challenge to them because those are all individual um, and then work from there and actually do 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 push the boundaries slightly do push the level of challenge slightly give that person gradually more and more difficult things and give them give them praise for the work that they're doing rather than the outcome so we want to praise the work itself we want the work to become the thing that's the gratification yeah. um so emma 8114 has said i love the quote self-awareness doesn't stop you from making mistakes it allows you from to learn from them so yep yeah, it's a fantastic quote and uh, it's very much true like um self-awareness and resilience resilience isn't going to stop you from making mistakes what resilience is, is how you bounce back from those mistakes um we don't want to kind of we we get this fear we get very fearful of mistakes and a non-resilient person becomes gets to the, posi the position where they're very fearful of taking chances because they're fearful of the mistake itself and the mistake itself isn't isn't so much what would happen physically if this went wrong it's more what would happen emotionally how would i beat myself up about it how how long would i hold a grudge with myself for not being able to do it um, and Princess Raven, first of all, um, said, what about when you're both at once? I'm trying to think if that meant about the perceptual positions where you're in watching two at the same time. Um, with that, I suppose we're flitting between the two. And, and I think the problem with resilience is that society really believes that person needs to be more resilient. Even adults who would not ever want to be more resilient, they get not accepted. So how do you guys think about that? Um yeah, so that's a that's a bit of a, a a big question. Do you do you get what like what that question means, Sam? And do you want to jump yeah, in on that I first? Do. I'll let I'll let you go first. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's messy. Is the answer to that? Is my answer to that? Um, how I feel about that? I'm here. I'm personally here to help. Like I said in the answer that I've just given, I'm here to help people who want to be more resilient. Um, society thinks people need to be more resilient. The thing is, this comes back to the word should. So there are people at this side of society who believe that everyone should be this much resilient, like which is, let's say that's 100% resilient. A person should be able to like water off a duck's back, be able to handle everything in life. Okay. And then there are people this side of, of this side of it that believe that we don't need any resilience. The world should just be nice to us. Now, both of my, my opinion is both of these extremes are unrealistic. They're not, they're not real. You get about 1% of the world that live in that position. You get 
about 1% of the world that live in this position. But those people are very, very vocal about things, okay? Because at the, at the extremes of things, we tend to get very, very vocal about things. So I would say that for each individual purpose, each individual person, you will exist somewhere on that. And what I will say from personal experience is that I'm glad that I've worked on my resilience from a personal position. Yeah. And I'm extremely glad that I've worked on it. I was, and I was an extremely unresilient person at one point. And when I'm still, when I'm under a lot of pressure now, my resilience sometimes still takes a hit. I'm not yeah. as resilient. It, I wouldn't say it's not always linear either. So it's not like it's not predictable. I had, you know, during during this whole last ten weeks, I've been. There's been periods where my resilience has been really tested in a surprising level. And I've actually had some insecurities from years back just crop up out the blue. And I think that's down to like the, the uncertainty of this situation. What I would say is just like with comfort zones, and um, we talked about comfort zones and the idea that comfort zones shrink over time, but also shrink due to trauma. I would say I would encourage a person. I wouldn't ever demand that a person does it, but I would encourage a person to be more resilient because it's the, in my opinion, resilience is like a, a lot of things in life. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So if you don't have resilience and then you come up against a troll, it's not saying that trolling people is right. If you come up against a person with road rage in real life, if you come and get up against a difficult situation in work or a difficult situation in school, if you don't have resilience and you need it in that, we can't just go to the shop and buy some. It is something that is developed and worked on. On the flip side of that, um, if you have it and life actually just turns out to be rosy, then there's no real there's no real harm. You know, it's like there's no so there's no real danger of having too much resilience, and um, that's that's kind of what, how I feel on it. But I'm very much I I think again it's it's like here is an option on how to on, on how you could not should don't use the word should but here is an option on how you could live life here is an option on how you could become more resilient do you need to become res more resilient if you're struggling with like things being too hard for you or like being too much of a struggle then maybe yes you do but is it an actual requirement it's as it's not society's business really whether or not you are resilient it's your business and it's your... a lot of it comes down to our personal experience as well dave i think with how i'd answer this i think it's a fantastic question for me personally i will accept anybody you know as they are if they choose that they don't want to improve their resilience and that, that's fair enough that's completely up to them but i think part and partial of our jobs and especially when we link it to our personal experiences we want to improve people's resilience because from my perspective it's made my life easier you know i i i've gone through a lot of difficult things in my life and by increasing my resilience it's enabled me to bounce back from these uh, much quicker than than when i did when i was at my lowest uh, my lowest of the lows so i think that as you said we don't want to say should but my job is to try and improve people's because I just know from my own personal perspective that by increasing my own, it has made life much easier, you know, bouncing back from uh, losing people, from failing things. It's without that resilience, I, I think I could have gone back to how I, I, I used to feel. And for me personally, I don't ever want that again. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a great question. But There's it, it, an absolutely phenomenal follow-up question. <laughs> yeah. So um, Princess Raven's absolutely killing it on the chat today. I think so, it's fantastic. You know, yeah. thank you for asking these questions. It's, it's good to you know to, to think about things from a different perspective well this is extremely this is extremely important one actually so it says how about people who cannot improve resilience i mean people with mental disabilities don't they deserve a society that expects less resilience and so less judgment when they are confronted i mean we are tolerant when we find out what happened to a person why they aren't that resilient but it's not their job to tell everyone what happened to them or of their mental health right and yes i agree with this 100 percent. and this is why i think kindness should be our default this is why i loved the fact that kindness was the topic of mental health awareness week this year because i think we should teach we should teach treat people with kindness and respect uh, like a, a, at all times and that should be what we start with rather than finding out that someone struck you know that 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 sort of the most probably spread around quote on mental health is um 
the the it's the um the most sort of quoted thing on mental health is that one that says people everyone you know meet is struggling a battle that you cannot see be kind always and mm-hmm. honestly if we if we led with that the i think the world would be an extremely um i think the, the world would be an extremely extremely different and much better place and yeah it's like we should um again i don't like i'm using the word should now but we sh- we should lead with kindness we should actually um now, and we should actually learn where the expectations are of a person from the ground up rather than starting high and then starting over the top with it. And yeah, um, you're right. Now, I mean, I've obviously lived with um, type 2 bipolar disorder my entire life. And um, what I would say is that within, um, within mental health, I'm extremely high functioning for someone with with bipolar disorder. I've met people that are actually more high functioning than I am with bipolar disorder, and I've met people that are a lot less. So it's um, and the same with anxiety. I mean, I have anxiety. Um, I've met people that are more or less, and again, where I am in my waves dictates whether I'm more or less um, re- um, resilient, maybe, or maybe even more or less high functioning in that time. What I would say is that um, to go back to your first point in the question is how about people who cannot improve resilience. I believe that everyone can improve to a degree within their own bounds. That might be naive of me, but I think I need to believe that in order to do my job, which means that I can't help everyone the same amount, but I can help everyone relative to where they are. Um, By what we do and what we try and educate with people, we can help a person relative to where they are. So a person with learning difficulties is not excluded from more resilience within their confines. Um, you know, a, the, a person with um, with bipolar disorder or social anxiety. A person with social anxiety is not restricted to to not like it would be harder for that person to gain resilience in social situations than it would a person who's not got social anxiety. But it's not; it doesn't exclude them from it. Um, and yes, as yeah, it is. It's one of those things that I always said that. Um, I should go, which should just like always said, I should just walk around with bipolar tattooed on my forehead so people know it and I don't have to tell them because I'm always like, hi, I'm Dave, I'm bipolar. Um, just but to help them do that job. But it is, a, it is an interesting one because I want to speak on this actually because of me being so high functioning. When I struggle, people still find that strange. They still find that kind of weird. And especially like I struggled, I struggled a day last last weekend, and then I'm you know I, I genuinely bounced back quite quick from that, and it's very hard for people to witness that because it it just doesn't it seems out of character from people seeing me like this on camera, um so it's um and I don't tend to want to be on camera when I'm all the way down there, so it is um it's a very tricky one, um can we can I touch on the compliment versus insult before we move on? Yeah, thank you very much once again just for you know for asking them questions. Uh, I think it's really good for for us to to be able to answer these type of things. Yeah, um, Princess Raven as well says her, her entire Twitch community is called kindness as well, so that's awesome. Another another person who values kindness as in in its uh, in all its forms. Um, so compliment versus insult. I was supposed to have two glasses on my desk for this, and for once I've actually tidied my desk, so I'm going to go with a fever tree ginger ale. It's just not the same as the glass you've been using previously. <laughs> it's not. I've got... Go I've, I've, st- I've still got a glass. <laughs> actually, you? I'll tell you what. I'll go with a beer horn. <laughs> I've got... This is completely decorative. Um, it's never been drank out of. It, it smells a bit funky. <laughs> so let's say... Let's say this one... This is a, let's say this is water and this is poison. Yeah. Which one do you want, Sam? Water. Yeah. You want the water, not the poison. Okay. Now let's say this is a compliment. This is an insult. Which one are you going to take more readily? Compliments. Really? Oh, you've worked on your self-esteem. You have. (laughs) But I, I love to ask that question to a room full of people and it does go. Probably about 80-20 in favour of um, more and more people are actually saying compliment now. I think we actually are beginning to get into a world where we're okay accepting compliments. Um, and where this comes in is we find it like there's an expression that for one, for every for every negative thing that happens, it takes four positive things to kind of undo it. So in the news right now, when we're reading lots of news, there's a lot of negative news. And you'll come across about 400 pieces of negative news or, you know, down, down disheartening news over the course of the day. You're not going to find 1,600 pieces of uplifting news to counteract that. And again, it comes down to this negativity bias that we talked about in beliefs. We, we notice the things that could harm us more than the things that could help us. 
So if someone comes along and you get 10 compliments through the course of the day and then one person comes along and says, uh, you know what, well, actually, you're, you're looking all right today, Sam, but that blue shirt, I'm not sure blue's the right color for you. It's like, we can take that and we can take that quite personally. And, and it's really, really common and really, really human to do it. In fact, um, often we, we read things that aren't even there. So if I came to you and said, oh, Sam, your hair looks really good today. What might you think? It doesn't. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, like, okay, let's just think about the sentence. Let's say I saw you running. And I said, oh, your running form was really good today. What would you think that that sentence meant? I think I'd be like, right, well, are you, are you being sarcastic? Yeah, or why did he use the word today? Like, you know, if I said yeah. to them, oh, you know, like, oh, your hair looks really good today or, or, you know, your running form looks really good, whatever it is, people focus on the word today and instead of hearing your hair looks good today, they hear your hair doesn't look good every other day. Your running form must be shocking every other day. It's like, um, I used to always get this whenever, um, I'm, I, I consider myself to be reasonably quick-witted, right? And um, whenever someone says, oh, that was really quick for you, I can wait, what do you mean for you? Why is that extra bit on there? It's like, that, it's like, it's actually, that was actually quite slow for me. It took me a while to get to that one. But, um, but yeah, we do often sometimes not even not even accept an insult more than a compliment, but we also accept an insult where it wasn't even given quite a lot of times. Um, and this is it is again, the ones that we take to heart often are the ones that we do think and agree with ourselves. And I, um, I have talked about this back when we were talking about body image, not on this show, but when we talked about body image last year, um, I used I, I basically put a whole series of posts up saying you can't shamed what I'm not you can't shame me on something I'm not ashamed about. So I you know coming from a personal training background I shouldn't have the stomach that I've got according to the society, but I'm not ashamed of that personally. So sort of someone else mentioning it doesn't change it doesn't it doesn't affect me. The only things that I'm vulnerable of. If someone wants to start flinging insults at me, and please don't, because like I, you know, eventually if a hundred of them come in, I'll start getting vulnerable. But um, but if someone insults me on something that I'm a little bit insecure about myself, then that has the real possibility to hurt me. That's a, like so. It's about understanding why we do things and what our values are. Again, going back to that thing before, it's like, am I happy with how I've lived my life? And we'll get a little bit more into that with, when we talk about peer pressure. Do you, want to, do you want to move on to fitting in and belonging, Dave? Oh, so that is, think, the, that is the next slide. Okay. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to start on this and then I'll kind of just give give some input from the school perspective of, of things that I see uh, young people are doing to try and fit in? Yeah, okay. So the image sort of says everything. I don't know how clear the image is on the video um, because it's quite small, but it says she's hiding. It's got vulnerability. She's got a nice little ball of vulnerability there and she's hiding it under a jacket in the first image and in the second one it says my friends love me for who I am this is the big difference every single one of us wants to belong right we we're quite a tribal species whether you're not you want to belong with one other person or you want to belong with you know a hundred other people you want to be part of a big community whatever it might be we all want to belong we all want to be part of something it's safety safety in numbers isn't it you don't want to kind of be isolated and alone um now we cause when we can't have belonging, which means to be who we are whenever around our friends, um, we will accept fitting in so that we're not isolated, so that we're not alone. And sometimes we will choose fitting in because we see a certain group of people as more desirable than the ones that we actually belong with. So the cool kids in school, you know, like that. When we were, when I was in school, I sort of stopped saying when we were in school. Sam's eleven years younger than me, baby. He's a baby. Um, <laughs> and um, when I was in school, it was the smokers, you know, the smokers and the cool kids, and even the bullies to an exact to an extent, like the the art the hard kids, you know. We were bearing in mind that I was in Anfield at the time, and it was like, all right, day day. Um, it was like that, and those were the kids. Now, I, I opened up about this on social media the other day about the fact that where my humor comes from is a defense mechanism for me. So the one that, I never went and smoked with the cool kids or anything, but what I did is I found that I could stop myself from getting beaten up by making them laugh. And what was the best way to make them laugh? Well, the best way to make them laugh was to take the mickey out of the teachers. 
which, you know, got me in trouble, but it got me in trouble with the teachers who gave me like a lunchtime detention or an extra piece of homework as opposed to getting me in trouble with the bullies who would literally kick my face in. I mean, actually kick my face in. Um, not an expression. And now, so this was the whole thing that was, where, oh, I think what was where one of my, my sense of humor came from. And that was it. I was, I respected my teachers. I genuinely did respect my teachers, but I was more fearful of what the um, the kids would do to me in school than it was of what the teachers, you know, I could take a detention. I took like, a lot of detentions um, and then so that was one that was the thing that I did was to, in order to fit in and um, ultimately like that was because I was getting bullied originally to, well the first reason was that I didn't have um, so I, I put my hand up and knew the answers to questions the second reason became that we were in, we had a very poor family at the time um, and I didn't have like the kickers or the rock ports I think it was back then and um and then and then the third reason because i developed the eating disorder then became because uh, because of my weight and i had a group of friends that all liked me for who i was and you know i could make them laugh without putting a target on me back with the teachers and i could you could hang out with them and we could talk about citadel miniatures and the geeky things that we liked and video games and um stuff because video games weren't as cool and as acceptable as they are now um back in the 90s <laughs> 30 years ago but um but yeah so so that was me trying to that was me trying to fit in and i'd love to say this just stops at school it doesn't stop at school um you know the person who goes out drinking with the people from the office because that's what they think is the only um that's what they think is the only option like they think that's that's what they've got to do. They don't like drinking. The person who tells racist or homophobic jokes in in the office because there's a lot of that going around, and then just feels kind of like dirty in themselves. Like they... it can even be simple things like if there's a, a box of donuts and say I didn't want to eat one, yeah. and then the rest of the staff are having one, but I'm actually on a diet or I'm trying to lose weight. Some people will go against you know what they want to do just to fit in with what everyone else is doing a lot of people not just some a lot of people will do that it's so it's so common and we think of peer pressure as being this thing where we think it stops with like smoking drinking and drugs and stuff in school but it doesn't it's like you can end up being like people all change supporting football teams to fit in with a certain crowd and all sorts the adults continue to do it and i think again it comes down to not being secure in who you are and thinking ultimately all fitting in comes down to these people if they knew what i was really like then they wouldn't accept me so like i mean especially right now um at this is you know when right now when we when black lives matter and particularly today um with blackout tuesday people are probably thinking oh you know if i stand up if i stand up for for people of color then other people around other white people around me might not accept me and so there will be people that want to but won't speak out equally there might be people who will speak out um, you know, there's the expression of virtue signal and there might be people who do speak out so that they're seen to be speaking out because they want to fit in with the group of people. And it's like, okay, it's important to know where you genuinely stand on on any of these things. It is important to know what who you are and what you are doing things for because ultimately that's what's going to make dictate whether you feel happy in yourself, dictate whether you feel true to yourself. It's such a cliche, but it's so important. I think as well, just to touch on uh, things, we, we, you've mentioned smoking, doing drugs. So quite frequently I will see uh, young people who come up to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm smoking or I'm, I'm doing drugs. I don't really want to do it, but I'm doing it because my friends do it. Now, what you have to understand, if you are a young person or anyone of any age, if you say that you don't want to do something to your, your friends, your peers, and they start giving you abuse about, uh, you know, not doing it, they aren't your friends okay someone that is your friend will accept you no matter who you are no matter what you want to do if it is smoking for example you know i, I and i ended up getting involved with this when i was in school people have gone behind the bike sheds in school do, do you want a quick fag mate and then you'd end up doing it even if even though it was against what i wanted to do i did it just to fit in however now i reflect back on it i wish i said no i, I don't want to do that but i know i would have got abuse but then people weren't my friends because they wouldn't accept me for what I wanted to do. So if you are in that situation and you don't want to do something and you tell these people you don't and all they start doing is giving you abuse, they aren't your friends. You need to find people where you can just be totally and or, you know authentically yourself. Yep. So please remove these people from your life. You know, my friendship circles have gone from having you know loads and loads of friends until i actually started to be myself where it's slowly but surely reduced yeah you know and even like you know we mentioned about the food because i 
I'm I'm not that strict with what I eat, but because I'm I'm training for a lot of races, I do like to to, to watch what I eat in the week. But I've had abuse, you know, in the in offices in the past where if I don't have a chocolate, people are like, why are you having a chocolate? Why, why are you not having one? Come on, have one, have one. Trying to pressure me into to doing something that I, I don't want. And can you explain, Dave, why will some people not accept that? Okay. Um, why will you not be persistent with trying to push somebody to do something? Yeah, so I'll give you a little tiny hack before I go into that as well. The, the, the phrase don't want versus can't have. Um, so if you're on a diet, uh, let's say you go down the pub with a few mates and like oh you say oh, i can't i can't have a drink i'm not you know i'm, I'm training for a race um this works with actually telling your brain this as well when you say especially to a group of lads oh, i can't have a drink right now even if you say to a group of lads i can't have a drink i'm driving you'll often get a bit of peer pressure that'll be like oh go on just have the one and you have the one and then they go oh you've been here for two hours I have another one and this is how people end up kind of driving slightly over the limit and stuff or even quite a bit over the limit in the end because of peer pressure and that's when you say i can't have to people it opens up all of this weird dialogue it makes a person feel deprived whereas if you say to someone i don't want i don't want a drink i don't fancy it now like again women will get it slightly different as soon as you say oh, i don't fancy a drink as a woman you'll get asked if you're pregnant probably um was like but but then after after you kind of deal with that and go no i just don't fancy one and like that's that's the end of the conversation quite a lot of times and the same happens inside your own brain if you're saying if you're trying to eat less or you're trying to drink less if you tell yourself you can't have then your brain will crave it more will want it more whereas if you say i don't want it don't fancy it like it's like when it says don't touch the red button it's like you know we've talked about this thing we've talked about this before we say you don't 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 touch wet paint and i'm like <laughs> yeah, I'm just like gotta stroke that wall. Um, I don't go around stroking walls normally, but when we say you know, like when we say we're not allowed to do something, suddenly the urge to do it goes through the roof. So th when you do have those conversations, just tell the person you don't want it. You don't need to excuse yourself. You don't need to tell. You don't need to say, "Oh, I'm training for this race. And I've got to be up in the morning." I just, I just don't fancy one right now. Um, you know, I'd have one if I wanted one. And I've had this before. Like um, I kind of almost lost it with a couple of friends a few years back when I turned up and I wasn't drinking at this event. And it was like, first of all, I was driving and I was ages away from home. But the person was just like, "Oh, that's boring." And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I, was, I, was like, I am an absolute delight. I am a tremendously entertaining person when I'm sober. And I was like, I was like, I said to her, I was like, that's, you said, that's kind of offensive. I mean, I don't get offended really. But I was like, I said, that's, I said, it's pretty annoying that you've said that. And she actually turned around when I confronted her. Like I was, I said, I said, you know, why do people feel the need to say that? It's like I'm not, bo I'm not bored about the fact that I'm not drinking. So why are you bored about the fact that I'm not drinking? Not saying you don't have to. And um, she just said, oh, well, actually, I find myself quite boring when I'm not drinking. And I think that's it right there is that sometimes a lot of times people want to kind of keep you at their level. That happens a lot. And a lot of things are just not even thought about. They're just programmed into us. You know, like that's the way we respond to people. I said, I was you know, when we were chatting about the social anxiety side of it. And I said um, about like, if you respond, if you tell a bunch of lads, oh, I'm not going to the party. The first thing you're going to do is get the uh, the messages back saying, you stupid, blah, blah, blah. Why aren't you coming? And all the rest yeah. of it. What, what's wrong with you and all that? You'll get that little bit of banter. I don't think that's ever really, not, maybe not ever, but I think a lot of times that's not intentional. I think that's a lot of times what we think we're programmed that we should say in those situations. Um, and also, if we're kind of going and reaching for the donut in the office, it deflects off our own insecurities if everyone else is doing it. It's like like if someone else isn't doing it, it's often like um, I don't know. We've never talked about this. I don't think actually was no. the was the um, was when we took was when when lockdown first started and there was all these people like posting what they were doing, um, and then there was a lot of people um, also posting saying well, that person's making me feel like I'm lazy. That person's making me feel like this. Now, if that person is saying you should be doing this too and you're not, then yeah, okay, that person can be making you feel lazy. But if that person's just posting and talking about what they're doing because that's just what they're doing, they're not making you feel lazy. They're highlighting the fact that you already feel lazy. So like... You, you and I, we both run events. I, I, the longest I've run is a marathon. You're going for your 196 miles next year. Your 196 miles doesn't make me feel lazy. I'm proud of you. I'm like, I'm, I'm you know, I, I think you're absolutely amazing. If Usain Bolt goes out and runs, uh, un, runs under in, um, runs under like 10 seconds for for 100 meters, it doesn't make me feel slow. It makes me think that he's fast. 
And that's the whole thing, going back to that whole, we hear something that's not there. We, If someone's saying outright, you should be doing this, then that's one thing. But if another person is just saying, here's, here's the way I like to do things, and you're hearing, you should do that when they're not saying it, that again speaks to speaks to you. I wouldn't I want to say your own sort of vulnerability to a degree. Um, and one thing just to, to bring this back to the to fitting in versus belonging is the second point in this which is to belong me doesn't mean we're all the same. It means we accept each other as individuals. There's a big misconception around belonging in that that it's about finding people that are exactly like you. And, um, you know, if there's one thing that's true about humans is we're all the same. If there's another thing that's true about humans, we're all completely different. They're both true at the same time. Um, and it's not about finding people that are exactly the same as you, that like the exact same films, the exact same music and all the rest of it. It's about finding people that you just enjoy spending time with and accept you for who you are. Like some of my friends wouldn't talk about mental health the way that I do. In fact, none of them do. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of rare. Um, a lot of my friends don't support the same football team, don't like the same films. A lot of them don't like the same music. And um, it's like, so that's fine, but I enjoy their company and I don't sit there and think, oh, I can't be friends with you because you don't, you know, because you don't like late 90s, early noughties emo music <laughs> or like, or whatever it might be. Um, I think we've got, We've got another question come through from Princess Raven, um, which says, what can we do to change society that is becoming more able to create belonging for minorities and also deal with the frustration of a society that doesn't seem able to be influenced in any way? I mean, it takes hundreds of years to make such changes, thinking about suffrage or gay rights, etc. Um, I think historically it's taken hundreds of years to get those things. I think thank this is one of the beautiful things, thanks to social media, that's going to start taking less and less time to, to make these changes and to cultivate these changes. Um, gay rights took a long time trans rights are, are getting there a lot faster they're not getting there fast enough um but then but they're getting there faster i mean we talked about in in our in my school i didn't know a single um a single person that was out there was definitely um i think i think i know of about four people four lads from my school that were gay or you know they were and they were gay at the time would not have shown that one bit in school when i was there and i was in school 25 years ago so it's that long, how long ago? I was 23. Um, and I genuinely did not know a single out gay person. I didn't know, I never met a single a single um, trans person and until, until I was an adult and that was the first time. And now whenever Sam and I go into schools, there are, we speak to openly gay and openly trans people pretty much yeah. in every school. Yeah, it is. Um, and pretty much in every class in every school, I would say. And that's just... That's that's wonderful to see how that has actually changed. Um, in terms of yeah, think like I, I just wish that like like that that sentence that I said before. I've been meaning to make a podcast on this forever, which is we are all the same, and we are all different. Like we've got this whole argument in the world about whether or not we're all the same or whether or not we're all different. It's like we are all the same in the fact that we all have the same, We sh and again should, all have the same basic human rights and basic human needs. Um, but we are all different in our interpretation of our personality within that. And again, do we need to celebrate? Like when we spend too much time focusing on the fact of us being the same, what happens is we end up pushing people who aren't normal to the fringes and making those people feel excluded but then at the same time when we when we spend too much time focusing on the fact that we're all different then we also end up creating these strange fringes where the person's trying to find their tribe that they belong with and they don't find the person that fits every single one of these boxes and this is what i mean is it's actually about it's about celebrating both our similarities and our differences which is what we do push in schools. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Do you, do, you, do you want, shall we move on to the grudges and forgiveness bit, Dave? I'm conscious of time, you see. <laughs> yeah, we are, this, one's going, this one's going over big time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, one, one, one last thing on that post, sorry. Creating an environment, um, creating an environment where others can belong. What you can do as a person to create these situations. If a person comes to you and they don't want to do some of the things that your group do, just be like, that's cool. We like you for who you are. You don't have to do this. You don't want to go skating with us. You don't have to go skating with us. You don't want to come drinking with us. Cool. We'll meet for a coffee at Starbucks or, you know, any any more um, ethical coffee place. Um, I'm not allowed to get brandy or political on this show, uh, which we have done quite a bit today. Okay, so grudges and forgiveness. Um, the 
There's a quote there, it's, it's often attached to Gandhi as well, um, about holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. The reason why we often hold on to grudges is because we talk about whether or not it's, yeah, what the person did to you is wrong. If you hold on to a grudge, chances are what the person did to you is wrong. And what you want is you want an apology. You want an apology from that person. You want that, to a degree, you want the person to feel a level of discomfort that you're feeling. Maybe not exactly, but you want them to feel something. You want them to feel guilty enough to be compelled to, be, you want them to be, you know, compelled to be a nice enough person to give you an apology for what you're talking about. Thing is, chances are you've probably been hurt by a narcissist who's never gonna accept the fact that you're wrong. Um, most people who are gonna accept that they're wrong accept it quite reasonably, quite quickly. You do get the odd one that it takes a big life-changing event for it to happen. But here's the thing is that you carrying on that, holding on to that grudge. I often talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't for the other person always. Sometimes it is. It's for you. Because when you carry that poison in your mouth, you're the one who's slowly dying from it. It hurts you and it affects you. Um, and this is also true when it is actually a grudge that you hold against yourself. And that obviously, you, that is intended to you. That When you hold a grudge against yourself, it's intended to stop you from making that the same type of decision in the future. But if you walk around holding a grudge to yourself, you begin to believe that you're a bad person. When you believe you're a bad person, you tend to act like a bad person. Even when you be act like a good person most of the time, you're fearful that you're going to do something, you're going to mess up, like, and you'll go like, what if I do this, what if I do that? And then you start thinking about all the things you could do to prove you're a bad person. People often then go on to do some of those things. So it almost becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in it. So the trick with this, and where is my balloon? I've really not got all my props ready today, have I? But um, the trick with this is, is to let go. And that sounds super fluffy and super nice, um, and it's one of those things that's simple to say, um, slightly more difficult to do. But um, if you imagine that you've got a really hot coal in your hand, that is, the, that is the grudge that you're holding someone. It's burning you, it's hurting you, right? You can squeeze onto it tighter if you want, it's gonna hurt you more. You can try and pass it on to someone else, it's gonna hurt someone else, or you can just put it down. Now, the way I like to do this, I actually don't, it's not called the, the bother balloon normally, it's called something a little bit more sweary. Um, but because we are on the family hour, it, will, it shall be called the bother balloon. There we go. There's my bother balloon. Now, what I like to do, it's a little visual, it's a little activity that you can do. And um, here, here it is. Basically, you get a balloon and you think about the thing that you want to release. And as you think about it, you blow it into the balloon. So there was a, there was a personal trainer at a gym I used to work at who had a big go at me online about the fact that I couldn't get results with clients. That upset me once, once upon a time when I was a little bit more fragile, when my, when my own resilience wasn't where it, where I wanted to be. Um, and I have forgiven this person, but I'm going to use that as my example in this instance. In fact, actually, no, I'm going to go to the bullies from school because that fits in very well with where we're going in a second. I'm going to go to the bullies from school and I'm going to, I'm going to think about them and I'm going to think about what they did to me. And as I think about it, I'm going to blow those thoughts into the balloon. So thinking about it, that's some of them in there. Okay. Then I'm going to think about it again next part of the puzzle. And as I'm going to do it, I'm going to imagine that I'm blowing those thoughts out of my head into the balloon. And that's a lot of them in there. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to hold that really tight, as tight as I possibly can. I'm going to feel the tension of that go all the way up my arm, into my body, even begins to start getting into my neck, my head. I'm starting to feel a little bit stressed about holding on to that. And you know what I'm going to do then? I'm going to let it go. And that, honestly, just don't sit look at it and be like what i've talked about like i am sometimes and go i look at the techniques and go that's never gonna work go and give it a try because i i delivered that as part of my month of mindset last year and the year before and the people that did it they're like oh i just feel like i'm without this huge weight and um, that i've been carrying around forever so that's if you've, if you've not got a balloon um you know write write your thoughts down on a piece of paper and then rip it up shred it yeah no, that's something that I personally done in the past as well. Same thing, isn't it? But just doing it in a different way. Yep. Yep, definitely. Right, bullying. Okay. 
Bully and we're, we're coming to the hour mark. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, please do put them in, in, and we'll answer the questions at the end now. Yep. Uh, we've got two more slides to get through. And again, if you are watching live in a school right now, this will be available to watch back on YouTube, and you'll be looking at basically from the hour mark. Thank you for um, joining us today. It's been a pleasure as always. As always, we're going over the hour mark probably by about twenty minutes today. <laughs> Mental health an hour ish, isn't it? It's, Look, you so, know what? Mental health can't be put in an hour long box. No, it can't. So, in terms of bullying, okay, if you are um, school pupils or you're sat with your parents, I just want you to to briefly think about the type of bullying that you may witness in schools. You know, the different types of abuse you may see, and then after this session, have an open conversation about it. What are you witnessing within schools? Because it has changed from from when I was in school, from when Dave was in school it's become more I don't I don't I can't really say it's become more extreme but there are more ways people can choose to put somebody down you know the access of uh, social media and phones now people are getting bullied 24 7 rather than just within school and um, so please do have these open conversations with your parents with your peers I think it's really important that we, we, we open this conversation up so Dave your first point would you like to explain that Yes. Okay. So bullying can often often be a cyclical thing. Someone who is bullied or comes from a background of having little control may bully others. And this, by the way, let's just get it out there, is not me justifying bullying. I don't think bullying. This is me saying it's not justifying it. It's explaining. It's explaining the motive behind it and hopefully talk, not hopefully talking about ways in which we can reduce it. I'm not basically saying that. Um, you know, that bullying is acceptable. What I'm saying is in the same way that, we'll go back to slingshots and boomerangs, bullying is a boomerang quite often. You will get a bully that is out of control in their own life, that is maybe they've got, they've got a, an abusive older brother, maybe they were bullied in, in, in a different school, maybe they were bullied at the end of primary school, they go into a different secondary school and then they think, oh, well, I'm going to be the bully now, I'm going to be the one that's in control. Um, so this is often the case, and this is this is really from a position of if you know someone, if if you are a teacher, um, if if you are a te if you're a bull if you actually you're someone who's compelled towards bullying yourself, open up and talk to somebody. If you're having troubles at home, to open up and talk to your teacher, or you shout who we mentioned on the beginning of this eight five two five eight because you can text them. Um, if you're get if you if you're in an abusive situation at home, please do text those. Then text shout and get some additional help, because the thing is, what will happen is you might go to a coping mechanism yourself, which might be to lash out at other people, because what you may feel from being bullied yourself is powerless. What I felt in school was out of control. I felt powerless um, from being bullied. And instead of picking on other people, my go-to was to go to a bag of biscuits and eat the biscuits, and that was how I began to develop my eating disorder. But for other people, if you feel powerless um, in your own family or if you feel powerless in school, you may go and pick on your younger brother or younger sister or you may go and pick on somebody else. And this isn't this doesn't just explain 100 percent of bullying, but it actually it explains more more of in more cases than you think. So that's to, to someone who is a bully. If you if that is if that is you, if you if you feel like the only satisfaction you get is by um, by hurting somebody else the, i'm going to jump straight to point three on this because it says some bullies just want to make an impact and it's easier to hurt than to help we talked about that before it's easier to get a reaction on someone by giving them an insult than it is to give them a compliment you give them a compliment they're like oh that's nice and then they move on you give them an insult and full-on visceral reaction sometimes and you can really it's so much easier um and it's that's the whole thing with the, with the job that i do my my essentially work is to educate people and to help people's m mindset in the positive direction I could do that in a negative direction. I don't see what the point of doing that is, but I could use my exact same skills that I use to help people improve. I could use them to make a person, um, to make a person feel vulnerable or make a person feel bullied. It's, um, but the thing is, for me, I wouldn't. I generally wouldn't sleep at night. Like I'm, like I hate going on sales courses where they talk about like manipulation techniques. Well, they're not, they don't call it manipulation, you know. But I hate sales courses where they're like where I know they're using language in a manipulative way, because I know personally that I wouldn't sleep at night because it comes back to this whole you feel in control in that moment, but then afterwards you're beating yourself up about the fact that you did it. You don't feel good about yourself for doing it. You feel like you're a terrible person. And then that whole cycle continues, you know. You feel like you're a terrible person. You get into a bit of trouble at home. Something happens there. You feel powerless, so you go and pick on somebody else again. Cycle just continues and continues. 
Um, so yeah, it's not. We're not saying that it's okay. But what I want to do is, I want I want people to understand both the bully and the victim. Sometimes, I think the victim usually needs a lot more support, not if not most of the time. But I think that bullies do need a bit of support too, in the fact that if we can get to the root of why that person is bullying, the person could just be could just be a nasty person. They do exist. This is I'm not being naive and saying that there's an there's always an answer for everything. But what I am saying is that, again, if we look at the kindness there and think about trying to get to, if you're a teacher or you're a parent and you find out one of your child, your, your children is being a bully themselves, is try to understand why. Try to understand that and help them to find a way to, to get that. Martial arts is a fantastic one for that. Um, and you soon learn, you, you kind of learn the difference, I suppose, between a bully and a person who is just, a person who was struggling with the situation and a person who um, is a little bit, like is is just a little bit more malicious in the martial arts because you know you end up with a person who finds a discipline from it and finds an enjoyment from it finds the control from it or you end up with a person that still just wants to hurt people i'm not sitting here and saying that both of those types of people don't exist um, i think that would be very naive of me to say so but, i think it's important to to sort of reflect on that the the consequences of bullying as well can be fatal you know we do have to put that out there as much as the, the victim needs support, the bully, you know, needs support as well. If you intentionally go out your way to consistently put somebody down, the consequences of that can be extreme. It can lead to suicide, it can lead to self-harm. So please, a question that I put up on the slides when I'm delivering uh, a talk in schools is, would you kill someone? Because every time you go out your way to put somebody down, you don't know what could happen that night, that week, that month, you know, in a year. So please, if you are going out your way to, to hurt somebody, Ask yourself, why? Why am I doing it? You need to reflect upon that. As we've mentioned about becoming more self-aware, if you do need support, do reach out for it. Just, sorry, Dave, I interrupted you. No, no, it's good. Um, it was really good, actually. And you know what? That What you just said then, if, you're being bull- if you do need support, reach out for it. If you are being bullied, it is important that you let someone know about it. Um, yeah. And bullies will often use a th- use threats to try and stop you. They'll threaten you that it'll be worse, or like they'll 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 you know they'll hurt you more. But it's important. It is important that you know these things. That first of all, you're getting some support yeah. about it, and that people know what you're going through. Um, it's important for you not to be carrying that all by yourself. Um, the solution for it might not be immediate. It it might not be bullying. So the fact that it's still around now in 2020 when we do spend a lot of time talking about kindness and stuff it's it's very hard to still fathom um but there is a speaking of kindness again there's a guy called brooks gibbs um and he, he was, this out? what sorry do you, want to, do you want to do just a bit so oh, I, I, have I you have you done this one i think it's similar to to what sort of i talk about when i'm in schools as well so i want you to insult me dave oh you, that's... I, I'll, I'll give you i want you to say about i've got a square head or i've got my my, my head's like a, a breeze block or something okay like are you gonna go in, am... are you gonna go in both directions yes okay. yeah well i'm gonna go in three three Ooh. directions okay so three responses of what i could do okay okay so just, this is not to offend me by the way i'm asking you to do this I okay do this to myself oh i'm so i, I was gonna I, oh, okay no 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 let's 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 do it let's do right. it um i just i i hate being mean to people even if it's fake um okay um you've got a big head right aggressive what's wrong with your head it's massive please don't say that what you've just got like it's just like it's not even a I don't even know. I can't, it's it's like a square, but a really messed up square. Please don't don't say that. Don't say that. Okay, so that's one example, right? So, the bully there has got power over me. They now have got that control. I've cowered away from them. And what a bully often wants is that power. They want to feel above you. They want to, they want to feel superior. So I'm cowering away. Automatically, you then become a victim, and they will come back to you. Try it again, Dave. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, say the same things. It's alright. Yeah. What's wrong with your head? It's massive. Back, right? And you keep coming at me, and I crack you one, okay? I react with violence. What that does, that then creates a very hostile environment between me and you. So if we're in high school together, and you've gone, Sam, you've got a massive head, and you keep coming back at me, and then I've retaliated with violence, one, that's going to get me in trouble, but then two, that is going to create a, a very tense environment for the rest of our school life. Because I've hit you, you're going to come back. We might bump into each other shoulder to shoulder. And all that's going to do is get us in further trouble. Now, say that again, Dave. What's wrong with your head? It's massive. Oh, thanks for that. That's really kind of you. No, no, seriously. Your head's, like, really weird. I think you've got a lovely shaped head. 
<laughs> you know, I do know what I mean. It's, so that basically, as it says on the slide, it says you know respond with, responding with kindness. You cannot respond to anyone being kind to you. They'll try and mock that. They'll try and go, oh, what are you saying that? And they'll come at you from a different direction. But if you keep coming back with kindness, there's no way. To, there's nowhere to go with it because what you will find is. Often there is a bully at the front and you've got all the little followers, haven't you, at the back. They'll snigger and laugh along. Often they don't want to be there, but they're just doing it just to fit in. Fitting in. So <laughs> what happens here is if Dave's the main bully and he says that again to me and I score oh, thanks, that's really kind of you. You've actually just humiliated the bully in front of his, 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 the followers, okay, because you've shown no emotion, you've shown no reaction to it, and that's what a bully is after. Well, you've just shut them down straight away. So responding with kindness... And I know it's so difficult to do, yeah. and you might feel a bit stupid doing that, but there's no way that they can come back to it. How can you respond to someone that's being kind to you? It'll yeah. just completely throw them, and they'll be like, oh, I don't know what to say to that. Yeah, there's a, there's a really interesting one in a Darren Brown book where he talks about res- just basically responding with, like, nonsense. So, like, if someone says, uh, like, comes at you, <laughs> and you go, you go, those walls are a very strange height. And they're like, he's, the person's like, what? And it's like, well, yeah, I think my walls at home are a similar height to that. And it's it what it does, and I actually felt this happening while we were going through that then, is when you said it the first time, I just felt, I felt a little bit more fired up and empowered to attack you the first time, which was weird and horrible. The second time, obviously, cuts it straight dead. But the third time, I'm like, I can't even... F- my, it, it you, you literally feel it discombobulate your brain and it takes yeah. it takes all of the momentum out of the attack itself and the aggression um, and it confuses a person it's it's very confusing and that person that could be enough to just completely and utterly um but yeah look up brooks gibbs um he's um he, he's he's got uh, some amazing videos on this um and it's worth looking at into bullying part two yes please yep so this the bullying part two really goes off the back of what Sam was saying a second ago in terms of nowadays it being all this 24 seven thing. And if you are someone who is bullying someone and there can be consequences like that, I think that I'm, I wish you'd have told me that question because I've never seen you actually ask that question before that would you kill someone? I think it's it's obviously it's quite a provocative question, but it's like, no. Like no, like I don't. don't, Well, no one's no one's ever going to say yes to that, are they? And and especially like um, you know, yeah, like when they're confronted with that question like that, it's just it's going to kind of set us on a certain train of thought because that's the whole thing is um, that you're you're not. You're not kind of killing the person directly, but you're the, you're, your bullying can be the cause of someone taking their own life. And it's extremely important to kind of reiterate that. And this is the whole thing is like, I, I wanted to take my own life when I was being bullied in, in school. Um, and I, I didn't, and it, like, I, I didn't, I didn't make an attempt when I was younger. And my attempt was more, when I was much, much older. Um, but life, it made me feel like my life wasn't worth living. And especially to, to in, in school, we've talked about this before, is that when we talked about depression, is that your frame of reference in time is different. So for me right now, to live through, I don't know, to live through, a, not that to live through a year of depression is easy. It's not, it's never going to be. But at 38 years old, it's a smaller portion of my life than it was at 15 years old. And when you, when I was 15, it was very easy for me to believe, even though school was, I had one more year of school to go when I was at my, my absolute worst was year 10. And I think because I moved schools in year 11, I went to a nicer school. Um, and I wasn't bullied in the nicer school. In fact, I had my scout sacks into my shaved head, so I was left alone. And, um, I think like even in that, even in those last few months of year 10, when I knew I was moving, there was still part of my brain that's like, how can I survive these next few months? Because those months, they feel like forever. They feel like absolutely forever to a person. And um, we, we talk about this a lot. Um, one, um, on, also on Twitch, actually, um, is, there's a guy I know called Mounty21, and he's going to be doing a um, a live stream, charity live stream this Saturday for Young Minds, which are a UK charity based um, helping young people with mental health. And specifically, it's about bullying. And I was chatting to him the, um, the other day, and he's around Sam's age. But he said, uh, we were both chatting about the fact that we're so grateful that when we were bullied in school, that... I went home and the bullying stopped. You know, I had my I felt like my life was dreadful back then, but I was getting 16 hours bullying free every single day. 
I had eight hours or whatever I got. So nine, nine till three thirty. So that's what six and a half hours of being bullied, essentially, or the potential of being bullied. Um, and then eighteen hours, seventeen and a half hours of being bully free. And um, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the fact that I didn't have the phone. And he, I, we talk about the phone, but what he said, and especially this is very relevant where we're on, while we're on Twitch, is he said, what about if you go home and you want to play your favorite game? You want to just going to go home and you want to play your favorite game? And your favorite game, all the favorite games now are, are online. So you even want to go and play FIFA with a few mates. And what happens if there's just one of those people in that team, in that group chat? What happened? You know, what happens then? That person can then chip away at you outside of that. And it's, ho it's horrible. And we think, we don't realize the repercussions of our actions a lot of times. And it's like, okay, if you are struggling, like you, you, you want to feel in control and stuff, you need to find an alternative than picking on people. Absolutely. No two ways about it. Because you're going to hurt yourself but you're going to hurt someone else more in the process. You might think that having a little laugh at someone's expense, you know, spreading a rumor about someone like we talk about on this slide. Um, you may think that just being that person in the background laughing along while the bullying's picking on the other person that you're not really. But you're like, you're that person is going to feel all alone because they feel like everyone hates me. It's not just the bully. Your problem's not just the bully. You know, I talk, I opened up a few weeks back about my, my worst incident when I was surrounded in force-fed grass. It was about 20 people surrounded by it then. I still remember them to this day. I still remember them all laughing at me. All like, And that, that hurts nearly as much as what actually happened, you know, because I felt when you're in that position, you're thinking, does not do none of these people value me enough to to, to step in here? And it's, you know, it's not the case Every single one of them probably, you know, didn't want to bring the bully's attention to them. While I'm getting the one that's on the floor getting beat up, they're the one, and they're and they're the ones that the background laughing. They're safe, aren't they? And um, I think there's a great saying from this, like again from this week, when now that um, now that we're talking, like Black Lives Matter is is rightfully trending, and it is um, it's not it's no longer enough just to not be racist. You need to be actively anti-racist. I think the same is true with bullying. It's no longer enough just not be a bully. We have to be anti-bullying. Perfect. I've never heard you say that before, Dave. I enjoyed that bit. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to touch on the spreading rumours or games? So the, the, the such as OBS on me, that was a game that I've seen within schools where they're putting, um, basically, just for anyone that doesn't know, um, and I'm presuming we're on about the same thing here, where they basically put um, pictures of themselves on Snapchat or different uh, platforms. They'll put hashtag ops on me, and basically what that is is people will then give them their opinion. But because it's anonymous on a lot of these platforms, people just insult and insult and insult and insult. And unfortunately, it's, it's mainly to young women more than more than the guys, which I, which I've come across in schools. Um, so you know, if you are doing that and you're the person insulting somebody, and especially in schools, I, how I sort of challenge this is I I say to them, if that was your sister, or that was your daughter in the future, how would you feel if you came on their phone and read loads of messages to them saying, you know, the common ones are your slag, slapper, all these type of things are getting mm -hmm. you know getting said more and more frequently. So I try to challenge them to say, why are you saying this? And you know. What I believe is when I do do this session, it does lead to a, a deduction in bullying, which is which is great to hear. Yeah, that is that is good to hear. Um, do you have you ever asked anyone who's actually put use the hashtag why they actually why they want the ops on me? I've put it as obs. I thought it was observations, yeah. but it's opinions, right? Opinions oh, on what, me. What, why what why does a person like put that? Why would a person put that hashtag up in the first place? The, the, the initial their initial response is everyone else is doing it. Yeah. So you know it fits into peer pressure, fitting in once again. Um, but you think when 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 did, when did it start? Why did it start? But I think it's just the the younger age group have got so used to needing the approval of the peers, so that's why they end up getting caught up in that. They they want to feel validated. They want compliments, but unfortunately, these platforms aren't leading to many compliments. Because like you've mentioned in the past. Um, the negativity bias, you know, they could get loads of positive comments and then you'll get one person comment anonymously saying they look stupid and they'll tune into that. Yeah. So it's, I think that they are, they're all doing it and the majority have took part in this because the peers are. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one, like why people would do it, knowing that the um, the majority of the comments are going to come back negative. And it's like, I would never, I, I'd, I wouldn't be kind of volunteering for that level of, you know, like, I wouldn't be asking for that. It's a, And it's a, it's a strange one, because like, I'd obviously live my entire life practically online, you know, it's like I'm online every single day. Um, I put up thoughts about my own mental health, I put up my own experiences and everything like that. And I know that that opens me up to a certain degree of a certain degree of criticism. And I'm okay with that. Um, but I think I'm only okay with that because the vast majority of people do tend to play nice with me. You know, I, I've been criticized and I think we all, we all are. Um, but the vast majority of people do tend to play nice. But it's important to know that even, even in the most, like we're, we're even in the most kind of obvious of things, people will respond with sarcasm and will respond with jokes and we'll, and it's very hard to pick up on and will respond like with with hate sometimes in even in completely utterly unwarranted situations you know there are people that hate on the nicest people in the world so chances are there's going to be people that there's going to be people that do on on us as well and um, I have to remind myself of that, you know, I think I think The Rock's amazing, for example, but if you go into The Rock's comments, there'll be enough people on there that, like, call him a sellout or tell him whatever or, yeah. uh, you know, basically, I, th- I think, and I think, I just, like, I love, like, I kind of love his, it's probably a persona, isn't it, but I love kind of, like, he's always smiling, he's always happy and all the rest of it, and I find him to be just quite an inspirational dude. Um, I, I always say to the young people as well, you, you, what I've what I've come across and from the questionnaires that I've done with the thousands of pupils, many of them have got low self esteem. They don't they don't love themselves. And I always say to them, so why are you putting yourself up for a tr- it's like a trial. You're basically asking the verdict from other people whether they, they approve of your picture or they're just going to give you loads of negativity. So actually, why are they doing it? Yeah. You know, unfortunately though, this is how they're growing up. They're growing up more and more being reliant on other people's opinions of them. So he's trying to teach them self-love without the need of this external validation. It's yeah. a very difficult thing to try and combat. Yeah, absolutely. And it comes back to what a lot we talked about on the self-image and body image weeks, where we talk about the only person whose opinion that matters on you is you. And that's that's whose approval that we're looking for. From an early age, we're looking for our parents' approval. And then maybe we start looking for the approval of kids in school so we can fit in, so we can belong, so we can have our little tribe. Um, and then we look for validation. And then we just carry on looking for validation from the internet. Um, and um, and then obviously that's why these things come around because we put ourselves in a position we have to make ourselves vulnerable to the possibility of insult because we want to put us makes ourselves vulnerable to the possibility of a compliment. Now you know what I talked about my suicide attempt and how I put that thing on Facebook saying I need a hug and this is Facebook eleven years ago so two thousand and nine you know very different world on Facebook back then. And what I I always say when we talk about this in schools that I shouldn't have put I need a hug on Facebook because I was really, really, I wasn't looking for attention. I was looking for connection. And I was looking for connection from maybe one of three people. One, the the girl I would just broken up from. Two, my mum. Or three, my best friend. You know, those were probably the three people that I got it. The first one probably shouldn't have been looking for connection there anyway because what I was hurting, I was like, you know, it, it just destroyed my entire life and by being with her and then, then we broke up. Um, and then the second one was my mum. My mum was one of the bridges that had burnt by destroying my entire life being with this person. And the third one was my best friend. Again, burnt the bridges with him. Now, if I had a turn around and saw, if I'd looked at that, and you don't look at these things objectively when you're in an extremely traumatic and an emotional situation. But if I'd have looked at that now and said, right, well, what did I actually want in that situation? I wanted connection with one of those three people. And I always say that if I had just messaged Stu, my best mate, and said, Stu, I know we're not speaking right now, but I'm really, really struggling and I need you. He'd have been there in a heartbeat and I'd have got what I needed. So if you actually do still need someone, if you're working towards self-esteem, and I know that's going that's to come back up again on our Q&A in two weeks, um, but if you're working towards self-esteem and you've not got there yet and you still need someone else to kind of know who that person is that you trust, whether it's a best friend or a sister or your mum or a, a, a teacher. And instead of going and asking for ops on me on an app where everyone, it's a free for all, you're inviting, that's like, you know, the whole, the college part, the high school parties that happen on, on TV. You invite three people and, and, and you say, we're going to keep it low key if anyone's watched Sex Education. It's like that. We're going to keep it low key. It's going to be super chill. And then you end up with an entire house ransacked by people that you don't even know. I like that's that film, isn't it? Um, which one? 
American oh, American Project. Pie. Oh. Project. Oh, X, is it? Well, yeah, Project X, the part, the, the house part yeah. that ends up getting people arrested and all sorts. Yeah. But this is this is what this is what you're actually putting yourself in for when you use something like Ops on Me, is that you are not just inviting your three best mates to a chilled out gathering round at your house to play some Fortnite and eat some pizza. You're inviting the entire town to come over. Your parents aren't going to be there to look after you. Crime's going to happen. You're not going to want to call, call the police and get protection because you're going because you because you're further down the rabbit hole and you're more concerned about your parents finding out what you've done to the house and all the rest of this stuff. And that's it. It's 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 a variation of that. We are, we invite you invite an absolute bunch of terrors into the equation when you actually use something like that. Speak to that one friend that you can that you value the opinion of. You know, if you want to go, do what does this dress look good? And you're not, and you're not 100 percent sure yourself, and you do want some external validation. Go and speak to your best mate about it. Don't put a picture on Instagram and go, "Does this dress look good?" Because you might get 80 people saying yes, and one person saying nah, and that one person could hurt you. That could hurt you. So um, yeah, I Stay. think Dave. I think we're gonna have to. We've gone well over. I know we? we've got a couple more questions I don't though. I think we could touch on, but I will try and bring that into the the, the next. Um, session. You've got a couple of questions. Yeah. Did we, did we have another one? Oh, homework. Oh no, the homework's from last week. I've just not changed the take the slide off. And um, Princess Raven said, "How do you cope with those memories as an adult when you still see those people, parents, for example?" Um, so my uh, my I suppose abuse as a child from uh, was um, was from my dad, and my dad died when I was nineteen, so I don't have to see him. Um, although I had made good of it, I had a decent relationship with my dad for the last two years of his life. Um, when my brother fell out with my dad and then I, I'm the type of person this is a part of resilience how I look at that situation instead of saying for the first 17 years of my life my dad didn't want anything to do with me except for when he was shouting at me um, and then for the last two years of my life yeah finally showed up only because um, only because my other brother um, had stopped speaking to him and so he realized that he had a second son um, because he'd lost his first one I could look at it like that I don't look at it like that. How I look at it is I look at it as I'm grateful for the fact that I got to spend two years with my dad before he died um, because I'd do anything to spend more time with him now. And I, I worked with a client about this recently and I said and he said about the issues he had with his dad when he was younger and like and some of the ways he'd acted out about it. And I said to him, is your dad still alive? He's like, yeah. And I was like, go and speak to him. Like, go and go go and open up to him, like, and and just say to him, look, this is like this is how things made me feel, and and this is how I acted, and be open about the parts that you're not happy with about how you acted, and be open about those parts, um, and get to have those conversations because you're you're now in a position of being an adult, and um, yeah, in terms of. You know, in, in terms of people that aren't in your family, you reduce the amount of time you have to see them. Obviously, there's no need to see the bullies from high school. You don't need to go and make friends with them or anything. You, you, re, you've forgiven them, and I think I sort of glanced over this before. You've forgiven them to release the poison out of your mouth. You're not forgiven them because what they did was okay. Mm-hmm. You answered that per- perfectly. There, we've got no input to that. Okay, Emma eight one one four said, "I think a lot of young people look for validation when they post the pictures. However, it ends up being detrimental with the negative comments. However, they continue to do it. I've noticed this with my clients I counsel. Yeah, that's just I suppose what we talked about. Uh, and then Princess Ravens again said, "What if those bullies stay bullies still now, and they don't agree that they bully slash bullied? That person is a narcissist. <laughs> um, if a person, I think just a touch is something that we can't control." Yes, um, I it works up about that. That we cannot control or change them, can we? It's about focusing on what we can control. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, just... No, that's like no, that's important. Um, but I would say that if the person can't accept the fact that they bullied you or were a bully or can't accept that they made you feel a certain way, chances are that person might actually be a narcissist. Um, and that person, if you were to, if just ask that person, well, what would it, t- what would it take for you to be able to see this? like see that see that you did bully me and if you say nothing i never did so there's you there's your answer usually if you say what would it take for you to think something else and the person says nothing um, i know this is exactly how it is and you do what you can to reduce your, your contact with that person coming back to the word should right this is hard with families it's so hard with families but we think that a parent should be our biggest support and we think that a parent should be this and we think that families should be all you know like what they were on um I'm thinking of what the um, the wonder years um, going back like we the, the, we don't get shown what we don't get shown an actual functional family on TV anymore because I don't think they exist but we uh, we got we thought that the family should be that and when it isn't that then we start to maybe think that the problem is us the problem isn't necessarily you it's a problem it might it sounds like the problem is them 
Um, and yeah, it's a case of reduce the amount of time. You don't have to, you, you can cut the people out of their life entirely if you want. That's a de- of extremely personal decision. Um, because, you know, um, or reduce the amount of time you do. We, there was a brief point on the five people you spend the most time with, and it's like you know we we don't have to spend we don't have to cut people out of our lives entirely in order to minimize the time we spend with them and increase the time we spend with people that actually do make us feel good about being ourselves. Any others? Any other no, questions? no. <laughs> I think we've gone an hour and a half there, haven't we? So I'm, I'm just really conscious of time. Yeah. Um, what, just to end, thank you very much for your questions and your input. It's been, you know, we both really, really appreciate it. Um, so we've only got two episodes left. Once again, if anyone wants any questions um, answering, then please do email me on sam.tyra at lancercare.nhs.uk and we will bring that into episode 10. So it'll be the same time again next Tuesday at 10 a.m. So for episode nine, I still can't believe that we're, we're, we're at this point already. Um, thank you very much for all, all your support um, and I hope you and all your families and friends stay safe throughout this uh, challenging time. So thank you for tuning in. Okay. Um, Princess Raven says she can't really read the email address. It's still probably a little bit blurry on the screen. Because um, you're, okay. you're following me on Twitch, um, Princess Raven, if you want, just send me a message directly on Twitch. Um, that'll be easier. Um, yeah, and so just send me a message to Mindset by Dave, either here or any other social media platform. One more thing to say to anyone who is watching this and getting a lot of value out of this, because we are bringing the family hour to to a sort of close in two in two years, <laughs> in two weeks, is <laughs> that real. I will continue to use my Twitch channel um, to to produce mental health content, and I am working up towards on the twenty sixth of February next year doing something called the Mental Health Marathon, which is going to be a twenty six point two hour live stream talking to people about mental health. Sam's going to be involved in that, and Sam's going to be involved in some of the events that lead up to that as well so there is going to be continuous mindset and mental health content coming through my twitch page and also through the youtube channel so please do subscribe after this um you know not just kind of come along for the 10 weeks if you have found some value in what we talk about on here sam is an you know sam's an integral part of my of my um my business life and my like nowadays so he'll be he'll be back as well um, and i'll be here um you know kind of sometimes just talking mental health other times playing games other times you know but i'm always open for a conversation and if you if you um if you saw like for example today um i actually really enjoy getting into the conversation into the questions on this on the chat as well so um please do kind of check out if you're watching this on youtube check out the twitch channel as well which is twitch.tv slash mindset by dave thank you very much thanks for tuning in everyone no problems see you next week